I'm on it. <laughs> we have the record button hit. Well, my goodness. Anybody have any friends or relatives from Texas? Very Texas is pretty prime discussion topic for a power generation class, don't you think? So what happened in Texas this past week? What froze? Didn't their power go completely out, <clears throat> like almost across all of Texas? A lot of it went out. I can't tell you what percent, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of cold, pardon the expression, pissed off people in Texas, <laughs> I guarantee you. Uh, water mains freezing and all. Yeah, and so we had a comment in the classroom here that uh, it froze. Well, more specifically, what froze? But specifically, what froze? What assets froze? Was it the transformers? No, sir. Good guess. <laughs> now, what froze? I said that because that's what happened here. What's that? Say that again. The reason I said that is I watched several transformers explode here. Well, there may have been some transformers. I, did, I personally did not hear anything about transformers, but I mean, I, they had multiple types of equipment failures. But one thing that failed was uh, some of their windmills froze up. And they had uh, pictures of one or two with, I think they showed the same one. I think it was the same poor windmill that every time they showed one, they showed the same one, but it had big icicles hanging over it and it was sitting there not turning. Uh, I think they went from I, I, I heard these numbers, I don't know if they're correct, but on wind power from something like 40 gigawatts down to eight on wind production. So wind was a factor. But I've heard it said multiple times, the biggest factor was natural gas plants coming offline. And they, they even had a nuclear plant go down for a while a nuclear plant went down because a key temperature sensor froze. And without that correct temperature input, the control system shut down the plant, as it probably should. You know, you don't want to be running a nuke plant without proper instrumentation. So they lost, I think, one nuclear plant for a little while. I don't know the timing, but they also lost a good bit of natural gas. And I think, and, 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 and their solar was down because a solar collector can't, can't produce much when it's covered in four or five inches of snow. <laughs> they, don't, they don't work too well. And the battery storage, when the batteries get that cold, the batteries lose, they don't have much effect. So we had multiple system failures. Now, let me see if I can find this. Uh, what type of batteries do they use? Are they chemical storage or are they like a mechanical storage? No, I mean, it's a, it's a battery type battery. It's a, a, what a, I, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on battery, but it's whatever batteries that you would typically use with a large power, you know, a, a large solar field. I'm sure there's a standard battery. Um, whether it's a lithium ion or I'm not sure what they're putting in. But so I started thinking because on the natural gas, it wasn't the plants, it was the supply. They couldn't get natural gas to the plants. They said that the pipeline froze up. Well, what temperature do you have to get to before you freeze natural gas? I'm not sure, but it's pretty damn cold <laughs> between you and me and the fence post, you know, like minus 200 Fahrenheit or something. So it's not natural gas per se that's freezing, right? It can't be. So, but I didn't know. You know I never really thought about this. I, I'd, I'd never really heard of natural gas pipelines freezing. And so I pulled up this paper and I'll email this to you guys, but, and we're not gonna read very much of it, but so I found this to be very interesting. 
this is uh, a problem. Freezing can occur not only when water in the gas, uh, natural gas stream mixes uh, with temperatures below 32. So, you know, and there's gonna be water vapor inside the pipe, you know, because this stuff's coming out of a well, you know, you're not gonna get all the water out of it, okay? But also with the presence of hydrates well above the freezing mark. Freezing can occur in natural uh, gas from gas wells and from produced gas from crude oil wells. Uh, it can occur at any point from production to delivery. So knowing the best way to prevent this is obviously pretty important, especially in Texas right now. Uh, free flowing gas stream, blah, 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 blah. Uh, let's see, uh, best way to prevent freezing is to anticipate where the problem most likely occur, areas, they got a little example here, let's see, areas where there'll be a drop in pressure or restriction in flow or likely spots for freezing. Uh, temperatures drop about seven degrees Fahrenheit for every 100 PSI pressure reduction. Uh, so even if, the uh, flow stream of gas is at a temperature above freezing, that temperature could drop below freezing with a reduction in pressure. And so, well, you know, it's colder than bejeebers. So everybody that's using natural gas is pulling max natural gas out of the pipeline. What happens to the pipeline pressure? It falls. I mean, you know, it's pretty simple. For example, gas flowing through a pipeline at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 800 PSI will not see any effects of freezing. Well, I believe that, that's pretty common sense. However, if you cut the pressure in the pipeline to 100 PSI, the temperature of the gas will drop nearly 50 degrees F, plummeting it below freezing. So it was a combination. And he talks here, not only it's, there's also, uh, uh, we can form hydrates in here. Uh, where is he talking about hydrates? Uh, hydrates form and hydrates uh, freeze at a, a higher temperature than water does. So hydrates form when water vapor combines with hydrocarbons to produce a compound that will condense and freeze at temperatures well above the freezing point of water. So they can form balls of ice and blah, 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 blah. So that's what happened in Texas. So they couldn't get the gas to the gas fired uh, power plants. And so a lot of them, I don't know if all of them, but it was a major hit in production. The solar collectors were, which I think I've heard it said that only about 10% of their grid is solar collectors. And wind is a larger percentage. Texas has more wind uh, capacity than any state in the union. I mean, there by far, there's huge wind farms out on the plains of Texas. And, you know, the wind blows out there. And, you know, I mean, it makes some sense. Well, so some other things that I found is that windmills operate like successfully in Northern Canada, but they wouldn't operate in Texas. You know why? They didn't buy the low temperature accessory package because the guys buying the windmill say, we don't need to spend that extra money in Texas. So they didn't buy the windmills that can operate in very, very cold, frigid temperatures. And so this, you know, they say this is a once in a generation storm. So guess what? They freeze up, <laughs> you, know, if you, don't, you know? If you don't put antifreeze in your car, you put water in there and it gets down to 10 degrees and your block freezes, you know, you pretty much know why. Oh, crap, maybe I should have put antifreeze in there. Well, maybe they should have bought the uh, low temperature packages for the turbines. So that's kind of interesting. And there's another issue here. Uh, let's see, I have to go to Google. Ah, here we go. So this is, uh, this is an article, I don't know. I don't really work. I just search the internet and look for <laughs> convenient discussion topics. But anyway, this is a CBC. I think this is Canadian, uh, comes from Canada. And there's, a, there's all kinds of information in here. <laughs> Little kids doing snow angels. Uh, 
that's pertinent and everything. But, okay, so here's, these are the regional distribution grids. Damn, you guys, I pushed the wrong button. Hold on, I had to turn on the projectors in here. These guys sitting, letting me sit here like an idiot. <laughs> oh, you thought this was just extemporaneous, huh? Well, it is kind of, you know. But okay, so here's the five regional distribution grids in the US. And so within the shaded areas, different power plants can wheel power to each other to support the grid. Well, look at little old Texas sitting down there. They're their own independent grid. Well, that's a, well, I'm just cussing like a sailor today. That's a damn good idea, isn't it? No. Why are they, now, I don't know the ins and outs and all the costs and that, you know, maybe they have to pay money to join an association or something, you know, to join these other regional interconnections and it cost them money and they decided they didn't need to do that, blah, 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 blah. But so they're not set up. I don't even think the transmission lines are in place to wheel power in from these other areas. So you talk about a perfect storm, you know? They freeze the windmills because they didn't buy the right windmills or the wind turbines. Um, everybody sucks out the natural gas, pressure goes down, it freezes up the pipeline and they lose a nuclear plant because some of the sensors are not rated for that lower temperature. And it knocks the plant offline for a little while. No, I don't. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't think to search that, but I know that there was uh, one plant. Let me see, have I got, I got a chat? Uh, that's a very Texas thing to do. <laughs> I'm getting better at recognizing my chats. Yeah. Uh, we, I mean, it's it, it, it's an interconnection group, and they share. If I mean, generally speaking, each like TVA. You know, see, TVA is a member of that southeastern connection. So let's say we had some severe weather, and TVA lost a, a couple of nuke units, which are huge. Well, then Southern Company and uh, Duke Energy and all that would do their best to generate more power and wheel it in and, and supply it to Tennessee to help support that. But Texas is out there on an island, basically, by their own um, desire, as far as I can tell, that they could be a, they could be a member of that Southeastern connection if they chose to, but they have chosen not to. And so they're not. And so I'm sure if you join, then you have, to buy, you have to build the transmission lines to various grid connection points so they can get the power into you from the uh, uh, interconnection region. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I mean, US and Canada share and all that sort of thing. The other thing that happened is the price of, because, I mean, electricity was so precious, what'd they say? The price went up to, the equivalent of $800 a gallon of gas or something to, to buy electricity on the spot markets in Texas. I mean, it was some outrageous number. There's thousands, I mean, thousands of times what the normal cost would be during the height of the outages and the shortages. So, and, and now, and now there's, there's, um, uh, politicians pushing to have the government pay people's power bills because it was not their fault that the grid went down. And all the people that sit on that, uh, uh, those, that Texas Utility Commission and all that's responsible for this, they are in the hot seat. So there's no telling. I mean, I don't know if this will lead to criminal prosecution. Probably not. I wouldn't think this would lead to criminal prosecutions. But, I mean, you can certainly see people being embarrassed and, and resigning from this for some of these uh, decisions that have been made. But, and then of course, all the, all the political pundits on all sides are jumping up and down, like all the anti-renewable people are saying, see, you can't have a stable grid with 
too much wind and, and solar. And, and, you know, there is there's some truth to that, I guess. Uh, I know Germany is heavily renewables and they've had grid stability issues. So, I mean, there's big issues there, but, and, you know, so there's people playing politics and, and you can't necessarily believe all of the stuff that you hear. So I've tried to ferret through some of that. I was looking for a good YouTube video that would just talk about it, but everyone that I pulled up, it was some guy from a renewable energy center saying this, or some guy from the coal Institute saying that. And I'm sitting there going, oh man, you know, you guys, you guys are shading this one way and the other. And uh, I don't want to do that. So anyway, that's kind of fun. Uh, okay, so test announcement. That'll wake up everybody at home for sure. Okay, week from today, we're gonna to have our thermo test. And or not just thermo, but everything up through thermo. So we've started talking about boilers and some of this detailed stuff and some of these steam characteristics and all that stuff. So that's not on there. So it's up through the thermo. And there'll be some kind of a thermo related test and there'll be some short answer. There'll be some uh, electric rate stuff. There'll be some power factor stuff. And I don't know. Um, for videos that I sent you links to, wouldn't be bad to go review some of those. I mean, I'm not, it's not going to be heavily that stuff. It'll be mostly thermo. I would expect 75, 80% of it to be just thermo stuff, working, working little thermo problems. Kind of like you'd get on the fundamentals of engineering exam or something like that. And they'll, all, they'll be targeted to, you know, feed water heaters and pumps and isentropic efficiencies and turbines and boilers and, you know, the stuff we talked about. Uh, Brayton cycle stuff, you know, uh, a gas turbine, something like that. Maybe a little, I might give you a picture of a combined cycle and ask you to do an energy balance around one of the components, calculate something, you know. So that's, that's what to expect. Uh, there'll be probably uh, multiple choice. So, you know, I'll, I'll work it. Hopefully I'll get it right. And uh, I'll put that answer in three or four more and you get to select the one you like best. And then the computer will say, eh, or yay, <laughs> depending on if it agrees with what I think the right answer is. Yep. So it'll, be, it'll be on iLearn. Yeah, and so people can take it wherever. I'm at the, in the middle of all this COVID crap, which is getting better. Oh, and I got my vaccine, I got my first shot. I'm old enough that I got in, had absolutely no effect. They say the second one is more potent than the first one. So we'll see, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a week from Monday, I get my second one. I'm sorry, what now? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I don't know. I had uh, no, I don't know. I might have been a little tired, but you know, uh, who knows? You're tired at the end of the day anyway, so I mean, I couldn't really tell. I couldn't tell anything. My, my arm did get a little sore swell up for about a day, but it went, uh, it went down pretty quick. Okay, so there's that. Um, so would, yep. So would you say a good way to study for this test would be to go over those homeworks again? Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned homework because uh, I have solutions <laughs> that I hope are correct. <laughs> uh, the first two problems, I actually, I have solutions from the thermal book that look pretty good. I mean, there's always possibility there's a mistake, but they're pretty darn good. And then uh, God Almighty, I actually uh, had to, I couldn't find my solutions to the second two, so I had to work them again. I was cussing myself by the time I got to the end of them because they, they did take a while. Um, and, I, but I, and I've scanned that. So I don't know, I'm heading out of town today. So sometime in the next day or two, I will email you the solutions to those and you can look over them. And then if you wanna argue or uh, talk about any of the numbers, um, in some cases I use that little calculator I've got. So, yeah, I mean, my numbers won't match probably exactly, but I mean, you know, when I make this test up, 
I don't, I mean, if you use a calculator or if you use the steam tables, whatever, because you'll be free to use whatever you want to really. Uh, if, if, you, if, if you put it in right, you'll select the right answer. I mean, you may not match it 100%, but you have one that's two or 3% off and the rest of them are way off. So you're not gonna have much choice as to which one to select. If you get it right, it'll be fine. Okay? Okay. All right. Um, another thing we're gonna do today for a little while, um, we're, we'll go ahead and lecture. And then I've got about a 25 minute um, uh, YouTube video I found actually for, for one of my consulting clients, but it's on modular nuclear reactors. And it's pretty darn good. It's some guy that teaches, I think, at University of Illinois or something, but he's pretty good. And um, I, I mean, I don't know much about nuclear and I sure didn't know much about modular nukes, but um, I sent it off to the guys at this company and they really liked it. So I thought we might watch that some in class today, just to kind of break it up a little bit. Okay, so let's see. So we're gonna start out, uh, here we go. Back to the beautiful, yeah, we're about to leave the beautiful yellowed notes with all the scratch outs. But let's see, that's where we're gonna leave. We got a little bit more to do. And you know, this is, um, I, I'll tell you something else I can send you. This is all taken from chapter one of the BMW Steam book. So I can email you the chapter. Now what you're gonna find when you get that chapter is there's probably 500 times more information in that chapter because that's the way the BMW Steam book rolls. And you know, and I, I will be sending you some of these chapters to look over. That one would be just kind of FYI so you might get something a little better than these yellowed notes of mine. But, um, so let's see, yeah, we've got all that. Yeah, okay, I wanted to look at this as under uh, key uh, power plant subsystems, because we wound up before up here talking about furnace pressurization and all that stuff, I think. The cogen we've talked about, I don't think I have to go back through that. But so, you know, we want to think about different fuel types. I mean, you know, back when these notes were written, I mean, we were doing primarily coal in this class. But these days, I don't really see it that way. I mean, coal is still being burned. And, you know, there was a lot of discussion came out of Texas about, you know, okay, so natural gas they couldn't run the plant because they couldn't get the fuel to it. The plant was ready to go, couldn't get the gas to it. Well, if you have a coal plant in the, in the wintertime, you have a 90 day supply of coal sitting on the ground right there. All you gotta do is take your little bulldozers out there. Even if it's frozen, you can take your little bulldozers out there and start running into it. And those little bulldozers will break that frozen coal into pieces real quick. And you throw it on the conveyor belt, bingo, you're making, you're making megawatts. I mean, it's pretty hard to tear down a coal plant. I mean, the cold temperatures, I mean, you know, cold temperatures can freeze anything, but I would say a coal plant with a 90 day supply of coal or a nuke plant, you know, the nuke plant going out was, I mean, that was unexpected. That was a frozen sensor. Well, they didn't buy the sensor with that in mind, I'm sure, with that cold temperature in mind. So that was really kind of a one-off. Um, as far as I heard, I didn't hear of any coal plants going down um, in Texas, and they still have some. So, I, I mean, you know, it, it just, it maybe puts a little bit of a different slant. I mean, you know, we're all trying to minimize the amount of CO2, but you got people freezing to death. I mean, there were, I don't know, 15 or 20 people that froze to death. And other, you know, some people went in the garage. The only heat they had was their automobile. So they went in the garage like an idiot and they didn't know about carbon monoxide and they killed themselves with carbon monoxide from the exhaust fumes. So, you know, how, how bad is a little more CO2 compared to killing 20 people? You know, I mean, I don't know. I guess everybody has their own opinion. Okay, so we, want, well, we just wanna talk through these subsystems a little bit. Some of this stuff we've mentioned before that we just wanna 
kind of pull it all together a little bit here. Um, you know, so these are key power plant subsystems that are gonna to apply to, to any plant. It's just gonna look different based on the fuel type. So, you know, how are you gonna get the fuel there? Transportation, you know, if it's, if it's coal or a solid fuel, you gotta bring it in on barges. If it's nuclear uh, rods, you probably bring it in once every couple of years uh, on trucks and reload and, you know, it's not a big deal. You wouldn't want to have an accident when you were trucking the things in for sure, but that's probably not real likely. Um, natural gas, you know, we just talked about that. You know, it's nice to have a pipeline, but if you don't have any pressure or it uh, freezes up, you got issues. Uh, if you're doing uh, biomass, you know, you could have a biofuel plant. You could have stacks of wood laying around. You could be gasifying that wood, in which case you're gonna need, or whatever the biomaterial is, you're gonna need a big pile of it there, you know, to go into the gasifier because you can't store the gas. I mean, not much. Once you gasify it, you're gonna to have to go ahead and burn it. So things to think about. Fuel handling systems, once you get inside, get to the plant, uh, conveyors, crushers and pulverizers and coal pipes for coal. So the way it works in the coal plant, they got the coal pile and that stuff is typically comes in, you know, rail cars, chunk coal, one inch, two inch, three inch, four inch chunks, something like that. They just dump it in a pile and then they will load it as they need it onto a conveyor and they take it down to crushers that crush it to one to two inch pretty consistently you know, to make it much more consistent and hopefully drop rocks and, you know, <laughs> bailing wire and Lord knows whatever gets in those rail cars out. And then it goes to the coal bins to the pulverizer, which pulverizes it to the consistency of face powder, the coal. So if, if you know, and I haven't asked the plant yet if they're doing trips, but if you go to the plant, they've got these big mason jars full of pulverized coal you can kind of shake around. It looks like black face powder, you know? Um, and then that gets transported by the coal pipes, gets blown in to the burners, and then it goes out into the fireball and gets burned. So, you know, there's a lot. If you got natural gas, you just hook to the pipeline, you know, at high pressure, drop pressure to your, you know, in your distribution system, blow it in and burn. It. Life's easy so long as you get gas out, you know. And other fuels, nuclear, you know, you load it up every once in a while and, you know, it lasts, it lasts a while before you have to reload fuel rods. 18 months, 18 months is the refuel cycle, yeah. Good, thank you. Okay, air systems, we talked a little bit about that. We've got uh, um, our in furnace pressurization. We went through that last time. You got a FD fan, a force draft fan that blows into the boiler. And you got an ID fan, induced draft fan that sucks out of the boiler. And that ID fan, um, it's interesting. Kingston uh, on their ID fans, which I think are like 2000 horsepower, something like two, 3000 horsepower fans. And, they, and these are not big units. So, you know, at a great big unit, you'd be talking maybe four or 5,000 horsepower fans. But Kingston's got units one through four, and then our one design, and five through nine are a different design. Five through nine are 200 megawatts, and one through four are 150 megawatts on design capacity. And I'm not sure which one. One of them has the induced draft fans before the pulverizer. I'm, I'm sorry, not the pulverizer, the electrostatic precipitator. Well, it's the electrostatic precipitator that takes out all the fly ash out of the exhaust gas stream. All these billions and billions of, per, of small particles. Well, so on half of the units roughly, they put all those particles through that ID fan and it just eats it to pieces. They have to rebuild those fans every one to two years. They put ceramic, they, they, they glue ceramic plates to them. 
they do all kinds of stuff to keep that fly ash from eating up the ID fan. Well, the other set of units is much more intelligent design has the ID fans downstream of the precipitator. So it's a clean gas. Now it may have pollutants and it may have, you know, SO2 or NOx or something like that, but it doesn't have particulates that eat holes in the fans. And that, if we make it to Kingston, that has been a major maintenance bugaboo for the last 50 years. And they know more, Kingston knows more about glue and ceramic tiles on centrifugal fans than just about anybody in the world because they've been doing it for 50 years. And, and so instead of rebuilding the fan and the wheel every one year, they can rebuild it every two years. <laughs> it's still a pain in the rear. It's awful. Who in the world would design a power plant to pull all of your fly ash through your induced draft fan? It's lunacy, but it happened. And, and that plant was opened in like 1953. And they've been fighting it, gosh, that's for almost 70 years. They've been fighting this thing. And it still operates and they still fight it. Because, you know, they've looked several times at moving the fans, but then the fans was, are not sized right. They'd have to replace all the fans. They have to replace all the, I mean, it's a, it's a multi, multi, multi-million dollar thing to start moving those fans around. And so they just grin and bear it and keep repairing the fans. Okay, enough of a walk down memory lane. Okay, so the furnace pressurization is a balance between how much air the FD fan blows in and how much flue gas the ID fan sucks out. So we can adjust furnace pressurization by adjusting uh, the capacity of those two fans. Uh, steam generator, you know, I mean, we're burning fuel, we're transferring heat, we're making steam. There's, I think we're not through, we pretty much know what that's all about. Um, a flue gas, um, you know, we're looking at uh, cleanup, environmental type stuff. And later on in the course, I'm going to give you the chapters out of the BMW book on uh, sulfur removal. NOx and particulates, because there's a tremendous amount of information in there. And that pertains not only to power plants, but emissions are huge. I mean, no matter where you go, you work for a company, whatever, if they're putting up stuff, all those, knowing those regs and reading that stuff and understanding a little bit about equipment that's used for all that stuff uh, is very valuable information to have. So you're gonna get up close and personal later on here with some of this uh, cleanup type stuff. But basically, what do we have to clean up? Uh, we've got particulates that come from ash. If you're, and you know, if you're burning, if you're burning, if you're burning any biomass directly, you got ash. If you're burning coal, you got ash. If you're burning natural gas, you don't have ash. Nuclear certainly doesn't. Um, and then you can have uh, NOx, oxides of nitrogen, NO, NO2, N2O are the primary, and then we just write NOx, and that stands for all of those oxides of nitrogen. Um, that's what caused the brown LA haze. You know, the brown haze in the skies is basically NOx emissions, and mostly in the, from automobiles is where it used to come from, but now we got catalytic converters that clean up most of that stuff. Uh, selective catalytic reduction is a main technology for NOx control. Uh, we Burners, you can purchase um, in newer, newer units uh, would have low NOx burners uh, to burn natural gas. And we'll talk a little bit about some of that technology. Uh, SO2, sulfur dioxide, you scrub that. Uh, a water bath, typically a wet scrubber. They have dry scrubbers, but most of the power industry uses wet scrubbers. And um, use limestone, uh, the CaCO3 will capture the sulfur. 
turns into a solid product that then you can capture and you can even recycle the sulfur if you want to. Um, so we, use, we can use bag houses or electrostatic precipitators for particulate removal. So anyway, we'll, we'll spend more time on that. Uh, Stream passes ultimately. Yeah, this is the stuff we know. Uh, impact of fuel source on the design of the unit. Uh, tube spacing and fouling uh, is, is an issue. We'll see that for natural gas uh, units, they can be smaller with much closer tube spacing because there's really no, there's no solid matter that can accumulate on the tubes or uh, foul the tubes. Coal units have to be, tubes have to be spread out further, uh, larger tubes and that sort of thing uh, in order to prevent fouling and to make them more cleanable with soot blowers and things like that. So uh, the fuel has a lot to do with the cost of the unit and the size and that sort of thing. Um, the, like for example, nuclear units, uh, the turbines turn, uh, I believe at 1800 RPM instead of 3600 RPM. I guess that has to do with the steam conditions that we get out of a uh, nuclear plant compared to a combustion type plant. Um, so, and you know, we've already talked about fuel handling prep and all that sort of thing. Uh, TVA back in the day, they, they, before they decided to basically move away from these coal units, they tried all kinds of co-firing tests. Um, they did some co-firing with sawdust. So they would take uh, sawdust and mix it in with the pulverized coal and run that into the burners. And I think they could run up to like 15, 20% of the heating value of the fuel as sawdust, which in some cases was being landfilled. And, you know, um, in a lot of cases, you know, sawdust people can find uh, places to take it, but sometimes not, and it's not economical. And so it'll wind up landfilled. Anyway, TVA gave that a shot, but they never did it uh, permanent. Um, so, yes, sir. No, that's an interesting thought. Um, I have not encountered that. I mean, I, you know, I can't say that nobody does. Um, you know, no, uh, I've not, I mean, I've seen, you know, there are plenty of, you know, small operations that burn wood waste. You know, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're a sawmill or so, I've got a buddy out here, Parker Bowles owns Hermitage Hardwoods. And he's got a bunch of, he dries, he buys wet lumber straight from the sawmill and then he dries it. And so he takes, um, he takes bark and they take, he brings that wood in rough cut. He cuts it to dimension. So he has all this wood waste around. And so he's got good sized boilers out there and he produces the steam that then goes in the kilns that they use to dry the wood. And I know I've, I've done some work for Parker a couple of times and he, you know, he, he always complains about all the pain in the rear it is for the, the, the boilers that burn the wood waste because there's a lot more maintenance. You know, you got all that solid ash and you got to clean them out and you know, you can have corrosion and this, that and the other. And he says, I just want natural gas. And I just look at it and said, no Parker, you got free fuel, free fuel. But it cost me this to do this and do this, Parker. You have free fuel. End of story. <laughs> you don't have a choice. You start looking what it's going to cost you to buy every unit of energy that you get for free. And yes, you have maintenance and yes, you have cost. And yes, it's a pain in the rear, but you have free fuel. And you just have to live with it, you know. Go buy a better boiler, do something. But you can't escape free, you know. It's just too compelling. Okay, so natural gas, uh, is, they're gonna be smaller. Uh, you know, fuel storage handling is nothing. Um, shorter, not much corrosion issues. NOx is your primary uh, component and you can scrub that so we can control that. 
with uh, low NOx burners or uh, scrubbing it out. Um, coal obviously is more complicated. Okay, so uh, sometimes in a coal plant, we don't burn all of the carbon in the coal. And uh, that LOI stands for loss on ignition. That's a good thing to write down. That might be a test question sometime. What does LOI stand for? Loss on ignition. And what it means is that is the percent of carbon that's in the ash. And so what you do is you take samples of your ash that's coming out of your precipitator and you send them off to the laboratory because the idea is you know, we're buying all this coal, we're crushing it up, and we want to burn the carbon. Well, if there's a bunch of carbon left over in the ash, then you didn't burn it. Something's wrong. Okay? And so you periodically, I mean, it's good to do it every month or two, uh, send samples off to the lab, and they just, they've got chemical analysis. I don't know what they do. But they can tell you of that sample of ash, what percent was all these different compounds. I think they'll go ahead and burn it completely and then uh, they can tell by the amount of compounds how much carbon was in there and how much, uh, they can tell you all kinds of stuff about your coal and your combustion process and corrosion issues and all kinds of things. So uh, taking those ash samples and sending them to the lab, they will tell you your LOI, which is the percent of carbon in the ash. So, so you need to know that. Mm, okay, I think we've been over most of the rest of this. Okay, now I'm going to switch to the boiler detail slides, which uh, I sent you earlier. So you guys have a copy of this. You may not know where it is right now. But uh, so I think, I think I'm just going to take a look at this now. I don't want to get it too small, but I want to get be able to see most of it on here. So this is a you know cross section. Let's see, there's a person. <laughs> that's how big this boiler is. So that's probably a six foot person standing there. So you could measure that, create a scale, and see how tall this thing is. But it's a pretty darn big boiler. <laughs> now, 1,300 megawatts. That's about as big as a unit's going to be. You know. And so, goodness gracious, look at all of this stuff. And we'll work our way through, um, you know, there, there's just a whole lot to look at. Uh, this is your main steam drum up here, your main steam line. That's, uh, it, 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 and they're not showing all the pipes, but uh, uh, so the saturated steam comes out of the drum and where does it go first? It goes to the primary superheater, so it comes all the way over here. It picks up energy, and then it goes back to the secondary superheater because it's closer to the furnace, so it's higher temperature. When it comes out of secondary superheater, then that's maximum temperature. Off it goes to the turbines. We have a temperators, okay? And a temperator is a steam temperature control device. What it does, it will spray liquid water or cooler steam into the steam path. And so it's a very, I mean, that steam is moving pretty fast through this thing. I mean, I mean, it's not sonic, but it's, you know, 500 feet per second. I mean, it, it's a humming, you know, and so you could very quickly adjust the temperature by spraying into the steam. And you do it, you don't do it as the steam leaves because you're afraid that that attemperator, if it's blowing water, could blow a bunch of water in there and that water not evaporate before it got to the turbine. And then you'd slug your turbine with water. So they always do it in between, like on the, on the main steam, they would do it between the primary superheater and the secondary. So you would put it in in between and then the steam goes through the secondary superheater which gives it an opportunity to, to evaporate any water that you sprayed in to protect your turbine. 
So they're very particular about where they place these attemperators. They, they put them on the reheat steam as well, but they're gonna put it before the last reheat superheater. So again, they can be sure that they evaporate any liquid because um, you don't want a bunch of liquid flying through those uh, reheat lines going back to your turbine or your main steam lines. Um, you know, furnace area, we're showing burners stacked. You can have uh, burners in the walls or you can have burners in the corners. It's kind of interesting. If they put them in the corners, it's what's called a T-fired or tangentially fired boiler. And so they'll, they'll put them in the corner at different levels and they fire at it a little bit of an angle. They don't fire straight out. And, and so they make a swirling fireball. So it kind of swirls around. Because right in here where these burners are, this is where your uh, fireball is gonna be. And I'll show you, I've got some videos I mean, that fireball, you can't, you can't look at it without sunglasses on or a protective glass. I mean, it's like looking at the sun. And I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Um, a lot of energy being released. Uh, and these burners are spraying out that mixture of pulverized coal and air. Okay. So that's going on in here and then the hot gases you know, so your hottest gases are flowing, flowing up through uh, the furnace. And then this is called the convection pass. After you leave the furnace, we've got the convection pass. It comes over and down, and then we exit. There's your economizer, and then there's an air, it's hard to see. There's a, a rotary air heater in here, and then it, the gases go on out. I don't, I'm not even sure, that may be the duct right there. A little hard to tell. Uh, we've got pulverizers down here at the bottom. So coal's falling from bunkers into the pulverizers, they grind it up. And then we've got fans, your FD fan uh, is blowing air through the pulverizer that transports it up to all these burners and uh, gets it into the fireball. Um, and so your, your flue gas temperature is dropping as it comes across all of these. Uh, the, these are just heat exchangers all over the place. The furnace itself is just lined with tubes. This is called water wall tubes. Uh, the steam is generated in these water wall tubes. So this, this furnace area is a big open box and all of the walls are just tubes packed up right next to each other. And we take, uh, we take liquid water out of the drum down to the bottom of the boiler. And then that, that water is fed into headers down here that feed all of these individual water wall tubes. And that, uh, that water, it's being heated like crazy in here. So some of it's being converted to steam. And so it, it'll rise by natural convection. Uh, and buoyancy effects back up to the drum where you separate the steam, the water just continues. You add water back to the drum, the steam goes out for superheating and the water just continues to circulate through the boiler. So we'll, we've got some diagrams that show this a little bit better. But this is uh, uh, just another, another diagram. This, this maybe is a little bit better, a little clearer. Um, we have, these are conveyor belts that run up high. So after the coal crusher, the conveyors run up here to the top and they can fill the individual coal bunkers. And so this is, this will be a day or two supply of coal. And then as it's needed, it falls down uh, to feeder and then into the pulverizer and then gets blown into the furnace. Uh, wind box is ducting that provide additional combustion air. Uh, we're showing soot blower locations because in a coal boiler, you can, uh, you'll form soot, slag, ash will stick, and periodically you have to blow that stuff off to, you know, uh, it slags up, you, you can't transfer heat. That slag is like an insulating layer and you have to blow that stuff off. 
So you've got them in, the, in your furnace. But the, those are IR blowers, and they call the ones in the convection pass, I think, IK blowers. And some of them are wall blowers. Some of them just blow a section of wall. Others extend way out in the furnace. So there's, there's some different technologies. All this stuff is pretty complicated. Uh, but there's different technologies on soot blowers. And actually, uh, you can remove ash with acoustic horns. There are some boilers that have big horns. <laughs> like twice a day, you know, they just, and the vibration from the horns knocks the ash off of the two balls. Now, if you've got a house that's real close to the uh, power plant, you're probably not real fond of the acoustic horns. You'd probably rather them blow some water or some low pressure steam or something to knock that stuff off. And, and they do have to take that into consideration, but acoustic horns are one possibility for soot blowing. And, you know, so this probably does a better job of showing our different uh, uh, heat transfer sections. You know, the secondary superheater again is the, uh, for the sees the hottest gases out of the furnace. And then we get a reheat superheater and then we get a primary superheater, and then we get an economizer. So your uh, feed water from your high temperature feed water, highest temperature feed water heater is pumped through the economizer to boost it one more time, and then it goes to the steam drum. So here's your ducting, uh, here's your air heater. So then this hot gas, it's probably down five, 600 degrees, maybe 700. Uh, We'll go through the air preheater. And of course, we're taking the uh, air from the force draft fan and we're gonna preheat it before we blow it in. So that'll, that helps reduce the amount of fuel that we use. And then there's our uh, gas to the induced draft fan, hopefully to the precipitator first. <laughs> so we don't eat up the uh, induced draft fan. Uh, we've got ash hoppers and stuff where, you know, we get, you get some solids that fall off of the side of the walls and you get stuff that falls down here and that can be taken out the bottom. We usually have a little, uh, a little stream of water down here on the bottom. So when hot stuff falls down from the combustion, it kind of goes, <laughs> you know, and if we get to visit, we can, they, we can open up a door right down here and you can get down and kind of bend down and you can look up and you can see the bottom of the fireball and all the tubes and, all stuff sticking on the tubes and you know, it's a, it's pretty interesting view. Uh, this, is, this is Kingston. This is the actual diagrams from uh, Kingston, which, you know, are similar. Uh, and the Kingston units are a little smaller, so they, they may not have quite as many uh, heat transfer areas or sections, but you know, you still see, once you, once you get used to looking at this stuff, you see the same stuff pretty much all the time. Uh, these boilers are actually suspended from the ceiling, which is kind of interesting because what happens, a big boiler from when it's cold to when it's hot will grow in length because it expands, I think it expands when it gets hot. Well, it gets so hot, that thing will expand six inches to a foot, maybe a foot and a half depending on you know, how big the boiler is and what the temperatures are. Well, so you can't let this thing sit on the ground because it's so heavy when it starts growing, it's just gonna distort. So they're suspended from the top of the plant. And when it gets hot, it grows downward. Kind of interesting. So all of this, that's all of this is structural stuff. And all of this stuff is suspended from the ceiling so it can grow as it gets hot or shrink when it, if they take it offline. And of course that, that growing and shrinking, that causes stress, you know, that induces stress in all those components. So the more, the more this thing is put on and taken off, the more you change load from high load to low load, that changes temperature, that induces stress in a lot of different uh, system components. So the more, the more you take a coal plant and cycle it up and down, the more rapidly you are damaging the equipment just from the thermal cyclic stresses.
But so this is a little simpler. But again, we've got our bunker and our scale scales. They took the scales out at uh, Kingston. They couldn't make them work. And the stuff with some of this equipment so old they don't make it anymore. So they took the scales out. Uh, but anyway, they fall from the bunker into the pulverizer and then into, into the boiler. So they, this is a T fired. So these burners are in the in the, the corners of the boiler instead of the walls. Uh, furnace. There's your furnace water walls that are generating your steam. Goes to the steam drum and then out of here it comes over through all the superheaters like we talked about. Economizer, regenerative uh, superheat, uh, air preheater rather. That thing is a big, uh, it, it's like a big cylinder and it has a bunch of metal in it and it just, it just rotates around and it rotates from the hot stream to the cold stream to the hot stream to the cold stream. And so the hot gases go by on one side and heats up all that metal in there. Then that hot metal rotates around to the cold side and preheats the air just by in contact with the, all the solid metal that's in there. That's called a regenerative uh, heater. Got three fans. Pretty cool. Uh, let's see, that, those were units, uh, that's one through four and uh, five through nine are a little bit larger, so but it's pretty much. A, oh, they got a TV camera in this one. How about that? Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, so this is uh, pretty good. This kind of shows the whole uh, the whole kit and caboodle. So, you know, we, we, we're still showing, this is still coal, we're showing uh, pulverizers and uh, we're showing low NOx burners, uh, NOx ports, um, we got a furnace area, then, you know, we're going across all our heat transfer and we're coming out to the, this is uh, uh, the SCR for NOx control, like the catalytic converter on your car, basically. So, and, and so there's optimal temperature ranges for these things to operate. And so see, this is before the air heater. So this is like seven, 800 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's where they can do the best on that NOx, NOx capture. So they put it in there and then they go through the air heater and then we're going through the precipitator. So we're gonna get we're going to get our particulates before the ID fan, which is a really good idea. And then we're going to go through the wet flue gas desulfurization system. So we're taking out NOx, particulate, and sulfur compounds here. And, you know, there's heavy metals and stuff, mercury and some trace heavy metals. And some of that gets taken out. A good bit of that gets taken out either by the SCR or by the uh, flue gas desulfurization system. So we get some reduction in that as well. So the uh, coal plants are much cleaner than they ever were designed to be. Uh, they're still not as clean as, and uh, the CO2, the CO2 is going to be roughly twice from coal what you would get with natural gas. And, uh, and then of course, you know, nuclear, if you, if you have emissions from nuclear, you're having a really bad day. Because <laughs> 99.99% of the time, they don't emit anything, you know, unless they're having a, you know, they have some sort of a catastrophic failure. Uh, here is a comparison. Oh, I'll stop here and we'll go to that uh, video. I want you to start watching. But this, uh, this is the same size plant. And you can see the size and you can just imagine the cost differential if you got to pay for this guy versus paying for this guy, you know, and that's because we just have to space all this stuff out and we got so much more equipment that we got to have with a coal fired plant compared to a natural gas. And this is not a combined cycle plant at this point. Okay. All right. So that's enough of me droning on there for a minute. Let me see if I can find this link. And let's see, let's see if I can make this work here. Gotta get to my email. Uh, I sent it off to the, uh, the boys at ADM the other day. Uh, 
Jim Hoyt. There we go. Well, that didn't come up on that. All right. So um, if you search on uh, modular micro reactors, this is pretty amazing. Can y'all hear that? Can you understand it? I can't hear you. I, I can't hear you. I'm you can come up here. Come. What? I don't know. Can the guys online? Can you hear this? It's kind of laggy. Well, is this worth doing for you guys? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll stop this, and I'll just send this link out. This is uh, this is really a, a good video, but I, I don't I don't want to just waste time. I'm just I was trying to do something good, so maybe that doesn't work well. Well, um, okay. If I can't do that, let me see. I guess we'll go back to the other. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Uh, there we go. All right, so I think we were pretty much through that. Uh, I want to go clockwise. There it is. I guess I do. Oh, well, whatever. Uh, I don't know. This is large industrial power boiler. What you see is uh, a, a lot of it is fairly common. I mean, it gets simpler, um, but you don't have very much uh, superheating capabilities. You see the relative amount of tubes over here in the furnace. This is water wall. Uh, and so that's all steam generation feeding in here. And, you know, we do, we show a small superheater section. So this boiler could do a little bit of superheating, but not much. And then this boiler bank, this is kind of interesting. So this is your main steam drum up here. And this is a lower drum. It's called typically a mud drum because guess what? If there's any debris or silt or anything, it's gonna accumulate in the bottom drum. And these are just additional steam generation tubes that are added so that we can get more capacity, more steam generating capacity out of the boiler. So you can see this guy is not doing much superheat at all. I mean, my gosh, that's just that one little tube bank right there. Uh, but we can generate in the furnace water wall and we can generate in the boiler bank. Um, 
So, and then you, show, you see an economizer section, again, boost temperature of the feed water before we go into the drum, uh, air heater, you know, primary, secondary air ducts for, the secondary air duct would be for staging combustion. Draw your, drag your combustion out so that you don't just hit it one time with a real high temperature. If you can minimize that maximum temperature, you can minimize the NOx production because one of the main mechanisms by which these boilers produce NOx is by dis disassociation. So at higher temperatures, uh, N2 will split apart into two nitrogen atoms. And oxygen will split apart, or the oxygen doesn't even have to split apart. If the nitrogen splits apart and it can grab onto an O or an O2, guess what, that's NOx. And so, uh, 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 a nitrogen atom by itself is a very reactive thing. It don't like, nitrogen doesn't like to be alone. You know, it, it's happy to be an N2, it's happy to be an NO, it's happy to be an NO2, but it doesn't want to be just an N floating around. So if, in, and so the higher the temperature, the more of those Ns are gonna just pop apart because they get so much vibrational energy at high temperature it just breaks the bonds and, they're, and then they're floating around with just these single nitrogen atoms and they're, go, they're gonna latch on to something and chances are it's not gonna be good. So if we can stage that combustion, you know, partially burn it, you know, by the main burner and then keep feeding air in downstream, we can keep it burning longer, but at a lower temperature, then by stage combustion, we can minimize the amount of NOx that's generated. So some of that going on, uh, what else we got here? Force draft fan, uh, temporary air duct that's to feed in case, um, let's see, in case this was to be too cold over here, we can circulate some of this hot gas back over to the primary fan and over fire air. So it's got a couple of little couple of fans on it, but that's that's pretty much what's going on. Okay, this is to describe for you what a header is. And so the idea of a header is to either take a single flow, we could we can assume that we had a steam flow or it could be a water flow coming in here. And then basically we cut all kinds of holes and, and it's all across this thing. And we stub and weld all these individual tubes. So if the, if the water or steam's coming in, we're wanting to take that flow, large flow from a single pipe, and we're wanting to, 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 to spread it into flow through all of these pipes. Like down at the bottom of the boiler, we're wanting to, um, feed all of those water wall tubes with water from the drum. Well, how do we do that? Well, we have a header at the bottom of the boiler. So that big pipe from the drum falls down into this, that water spreads out and it feeds all of these individual tubes that then line the furnace. And so that, that water flows, either you can pump it or it'll go by natural density differences, because you got water on the back side and you got water and steam on the front side. And so, and, and then up at the top of the boiler, you have to have one of these where you collect it again and then put it into the steam drum. So we got headers all over the place, okay? And so guess what? All of these welds and all of these places are, are, are susceptible to cracking. And they drill these holes, you know, there's a certain pattern and, and then they hook the tubes in there. Well, you can get like they, what they call a uh, header ligament cracking, which is cracking between these holes. And over time, these things can get so bad, they have to be replaced. And these are not small pieces of steel. Can you imagine? You could have hundreds of boiler tubes coming in, stubbing into this thing. So if that header has to be replaced, you have to cut each one of those tubes free, pry it back enough, 
and then you got to cut this thing out here and all the supports or cut it up and somehow you got to get it out of there and then you got to get the new one in and get it back in place and weld all this all these tubes and stuff back into it it's a major deal so in any sort of a plant or anything where you start talking about headers this is what they're talking about it's and now you know like i said at the at the top of the boiler say all that steam and water would be dumping in from those tubes into this thing and then you would have one pipe taking all of that say to the drum so you've got multiple headers around these large boilers and again every time you cycle these things up and down in temperature uh you induce stresses in these i mean the hole is a stress concentration the stress concentrator by itself you put 250 holes in this thing and heat it up and down enough times guess what you got cracks you know it's going to happen and so again you know taking taking all of these units i mean this is this would be a good reason to not cycle a nuclear unit you know because you got all this stuff in there and you every time you cycle it you have temperature swings you know it's it's inevitable and when you have these temperature swings, you induce thermal stresses. And over time, those, and because, you know, you heat it up, you may put, you might put a region into, into tension, you cool it down, you put it into compression. You heat it up, compression, tension, compression, tension. That's an alternating stress cycle, which causes damage. And so the more you do that, the more rapidly you're accumulating damage on components that are eventually going to require maintenance or they're going to fail. So, um, lot to consider so anyway there's yes uh what did what did they call it now cross-section what uh I, I i'm not positive it certainly could i mean if, if you've got, um, and, and thicker wall components are worse. So if you take a real thin wall component and cycle temperature, that you don't have enough beef in there to generate stresses. But it's, it's the gradient across something like that that causes, and, and it has to be um, like a circular section because it, that, 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 that circular geometry confines it. And when it tries to expand or contract, the, you know, if you just put a, put a plate of steel uh, on a hot plate and heat it up and cool it down, it won't generate much in the way of thermal stresses because it's not constrained. It can grow in all three dimensions. But you take something and you roll that thing up and weld it into a pipe and, and heat it from the inside or the outside, then it's trying to, you know, it's trying to grow more on the hot side. And so it, it restricts it. And so then you get tension and compression in that circular region. So I, I'm not sure. I, I mean, it, it, if you could send me a reference, I'd be glad to look at it. I mean, what, what page or something that, that you got that off of. Uh, two blade locations, I'm not sure what this is, but anyway. So that's why I, I put that in there. Okay, we'll do one more and then we'll call it quits. Okay, so what this is looking at is um, where the energy goes as a function of size and pressure of the boiler. Okay, and so what you're going to see is, you know, if you've got a small package heating boiler, um, you're going to do water preheating and water boiling. So this is just going to produce a low pressure steam. So most of the energy, you know, a little bit of it goes into getting the water up to the saturation temperature at the low pressure, and the, re the rest of it goes in with actually generating a little bit of saturated steam. Well, then for a large industrial process boiler, then we, we, we still are gonna do some uh, heating the water up to saturation. We have to evaporate it, and then we're gonna superheat it a little bit, 
if you're doing superheating. So that's what that's referring to. Uh, industrial power boiler, it's the same situation, but we're gonna put more into superheating because we're going up to a higher pressure and a higher temperature because we wanna generate some electricity. So that, this would be a cogen situation where you're generating power and then you're coming out and taking that thermal energy to a process load to make a widget or cook some soup or you know whatever. And then a utility boiler, you see, um, I mean, it's these first three are pretty much the same, you know? So, so you know, we got to heat up to the saturation temperature or a boiler pressure. We got to boil it, we got to superheat it. And then by gosh, we're going to bring it back from the, after it goes through the first turbine and we're going to reheat it again. So it just shows the distribution of where the energy is used, you know, a comparison based on the type of boiler. So that's pretty good. That's kind of interesting. Okay, that's that's enough. I have.